much. <clears throat> Uh, I would like to, uh, uh, to invite uh, our next speak speaker, uh, Professor uh, Intrato. Professor Intrato uh, is a professor of computer science and uh, neuroscience at Tel Aviv University. He's an uh, international scholar in uh, neural computation, machine learning, and pattern recognition. Professor Intrato has been studying compute, uh, computer, uh, computer uh, models for learning and memory, as well as the signal processor uh, capabilities of sonar animals. Please, Professor Ekman. Thank you very much. Professor Lazzoli. Hi, everyone. So we are changing now from a computer to the more uh, interesting and more complicated computer, which is our brain. And uh, we want to hack and uh, read. Hack would be called neurofeedback in uh, our terms. And we want to read the brain, uh, which is really uh, the main concentration here. Uh, and if you think that what I'm talking about is uh, quite imaginative and uh, will not get into the market in, the, uh, in many years from now, then I would say that we are actually going out now into a company, which is this Neurosteer on the right, to uh, actually uh, make it commercial. So what is the problem? The problem is very simple. Uh, trying to read the brain uh, is quite uh, complicated. Unfortunately, the most uh, seminal work in this field was done in 1924 were in using prehistorical uh, signal processing tools. A guy called Hans Berger uh, was able to read the uh, uh, part of the brain or to read some uh, features from the brain and he started this language talking about those uh, uh, filters, alpha, beta, gamma, those frequency bands which he found associated with various tasks. And moving to 2015, we still measure uh, brain activity using such a large array of uh, sensors. That's not really what uh, we want to do. We want to uh, apply much more advanced signal processing and apply the technology that exists today in order to do the same thing. So the system that we are looking at has a single, uh, a simple band with really two electrodes on the forehead. And with these two electrodes, we take uh, the data onto uh, the cloud. There we do very sophisticated uh, analysis. And then we get high level interpretation of brain activity, uh, which can be used for a vast uh, number of uh, different applications. Um, the signal processing is quite complicated, but it's very easy to explain because each one of us uh, can do that. As you mentioned, I was studying uh, animal uh, brain uh, computation uh, to really mostly animals that perform much better than humans, but this is something that we humans can do. So we can all go into a, uh, an orchestra room sit there very far from the orchestra, close two eyes, close one ear, and with a single ear, we can very easily separate between the different musical instruments. Uh, so we can separate, for example, between the violin and the trumpet, although they reside on the, reside on the same uh, frequency uh, range, uh, because we can kind of read uh, the uh, color of uh, the sound, so we would say that the trumpet is, has a metallic sound and that the violin has a warm sound. And we, uh, those with uh, much uh, better musical ears, those who started learning music uh, at a very, very young age, can do even much finer distinctions, uh, say between a Stradivarius violin and uh, a regular violin. Uh, and this is uh, really what we are trying to do with the brain. So different regions in the brain, different functional networks in the brain reside at different locations on the cortical sheet. They have a different topology, they, they have a different size, different number of uh, neurons, different length of uh, their synapses. And the bottom line of all that is that their oscillations have a certain color. 
okay? And we are trying to separate the different functional networks based on the color. So unlike what we used to do many, many years ago, which would be putting a lot of microphones next to each uh, uh, instrument in the orchestra, now we use one microphone or we use one sensor when we are talking about EEG, and we try to separate the signal not using location, but using uh, the color. This is really what we are trying to do. Uh, well, what can be done with that? So first of all, Talking about the sensor, I'm going to talk about this very little sensor uh, that is going to uh, become uh, useful uh, in the very near future. And so people would not have to go with a band uh, that's very visible, but with a little tattoo that uh, uh, can be totally see-through. And you would not be able to see that uh, their brain is actually being read. And we want to read uh, cognitive uh, uh, information and uh, most of uh, uh, as well emotional information. Let me give a few examples but before talk a little bit about this technology because if you're not familiar with it it's, uh, it's a huge uh, disruption and a very interesting technology by itself, totally flat uh, electronics, which can measure a lot of things, electricity, so it can measure cardiac activity, it can measure EEG, it can measure EMG. Uh, there's much more here I'm not going to go into. MC10 is the company. You can look at it. Uh, a lot of money was invested by the U.S. Army uh, into this technology. Once we uh, have the sensors, let's see what kind of information we can read from the brain. So you can imagine now that using uh, just two electrodes, I kind of separate the brain into the different musical instruments or into the different functional neural networks. And what you see here is a continuous uh, representation of 121 uh, such uh, um, separated uh, functional networks in the brain. So each line is a different musical instrument or functional neural network in the brain, and the x-axis is time. And this is a demonstration of what happens when you try to read uh, the brain of a person who is uh, under um, uh, a lie detector uh, test. Uh, as you well know, it's very, I don't want to say very easy, but there's a lot of literature explaining how to uh, trick uh, lie detector because the lie detectors nowadays do not look at the brain, they look at uh, the output of the what's called the sympathetic system, that system which indicates uh, stress in the body and they try to measure all sorts of things in, uh, which are peripheral to the brain, indicating stress, for example, heart uh, rate or heart rate variability or GSR which is uh, skin uh, conductance. Here we actually really look at the brain. This is, uh, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, this is the kind of the warm-up of, of the test where a person is given one, given one card out of five and then he's asked five times, is it this card? And he's supposed to say no. Is it that card? He's supposed to say no. And one time he's, he's going to lie. So the one, two, three, four, and five is the brain activity representation of his answers. Can you guess where he's lying? Okay, he's lying only one time. Okay, so which one? One looks like very red, correct? But two also looks quite red. Okay. Uh, three, actually, there's a pointer here or something? Uh, this, okay, actually here. You see that uh, little uh, circle there at the bottom? This is uh, the area of the uh, functional neural network that is associated with stress. So you can see uh, the stress quite well in, uh, in the third answer. And what's more interesting is that once, uh, thank you, once uh, he answered and the next two questions are trivial, you see that there's really very little brain activity when he uh, knows that he's just uh, answering something simple. To kind of see it more uh, in reality, this is like a questioning uh, uh, in the company, uh, there are like several uh, 16 different questions. You can see the brain activity during each one of these questions. You can see sometimes there's more uh, cognitive activity, memory may be involved, etc. And uh, there are three, this is like three, 13 and 14 uh, are actually uh, also indicated uh, as stress as well. To kind of take it, uh, I'll uh, rush it a little bit to kind of take it 
to something that's uh, more relevant to what we are looking at. So here is uh, an experienced pilot flying a flight simulator, okay, something that you would consider trivial. Now you already know how to read this uh, representation a little bit. So basically more red means more uh, intense uh, activity without getting into the exact locations and what, uh, they, are, uh, what they mean. We see that there's uh, uh, kind of yellow at the beginning, which is normal flying towards uh, the uh, area where uh, the more difficult task is going to be performed. Difficult exercise, we see it's uh, much more red, so much more intense brain activity. And then at point two, uh, uh, the flight simulator is actually giving uh, the joystick to the second pilot. Okay, and you see very different activity when he is still sitting and seeing everything, but not making the decisions. Since we looked at stress before, we know that the bottom part indicates stress, and if you look carefully, you see that uh, in the flight simulator, he's more stressed when the second pilot is flying the plane than when he's flying the plane. So this is a very interesting uh, uh, demonstration that one, you can distinguish cognitive activity from stress, uh, and you can actually read each one uh, separately. And this is really what we want to do. We want to be able to continuously monitor uh, the brain of people who are performing very, very complicated tasks, very, very dangerous tasks, very, very uh, influential tasks like a pilot, and uh, see that actually their brain is performing well to uh, the task, so they are, if the task is now very complicated, we want to see that the brain is very active. We want to measure the stress level. We want to know that nobody is actually pointing a gun at them, etc. And we really want to understand all this in real time. Uh, just you know, one last slide to kind of show how different it is and what it is that we can do on the medical field. This is uh, how uh, we can read anesthesia. So the red part on the left is when the person is awake. You can see how uh, uh, the huge change in brain activity when uh, the person is anesthetized. There is this big wave, which I'm not going to get into, this uh, pale wave that you see there has to do with hypersynchronicity, uh, if someone uh, is familiar with uh, that. Uh, there's a region that is still active. Most interesting here is that you can see the pain that is inflicted uh, during uh, the beginning of the operation, those little uh, bars that you see uh, are indications of pain. So kind of to take us away from what we talked about, we can read the brain in, in various uh, different applications. Some of them are seriously medical, like migraine and epilepsy, anesthesia, and others, and of course, lifestyle. Uh, for our purpose, uh, we talked about this uh, pilot product where we want to measure all these uh, parameters uh, that I described. We want to um, measure fatigue or uh, um, detect fatigue, and of course, anxiety and concentration. Uh, to summarize, since uh, I'm uh, out of uh, time, uh, to summarize, uh, this is uh, what we are uh, offering, uh, and it has a lot of applications that you can think of uh, in, in your specific domain. In the medical, I mentioned some of them. Uh, cognitive, you know, from students to pilots, emotional reading uh, from uh, light detection to neuromarketing to uh, lifestyle. This uh, product or this proof of concept has already won several prizes in uh, various uh, uh, hackathons uh, like the Israel Brain Technology Hackathon where a group of people uh, created something called Emochat which is an emotional chat, two people chatting on the computer and receiving a little uh, emoticons indicating uh, the excitement or uh, the happiness of the other person for uh, what it is that they are saying. And the applications are vast. I mentioned dogs. We are also doing a, a reading of EEG from dogs, for example, dogs sniffing explosives to actually read and make the dog completely autonomous. Thank you very much.